I'm David Wessel, I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by Adam McKay, the director of The Big Short. Don Co we, we have made special arrangements, so everybody in this room has become a voter in the Oscars. I love it. I love it. You may notice that the median age of this crowd is about 20 years younger than the Oscars, and that might help. Uh, uh, Don Cohn, uh, who's a colleague of mine here at Brookings, and uh, a, a vice, former vice, <laughs> One clapper. vice chairman of the Federal ah, Reserve, no, no, no. and is helping to keep uh, the world safe as a member of the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Greg Ipp, my longtime friend, who's the economic commentator at the Wall Street Journal and author of a book called Foolproof about how just when you think things are safe is when you should start worrying. Uh, <laughs> Danny Moses, who was at Front Point, uh, played by Rafe Spall in the movie. Uh, I'm tempted to ask you about like restaurants and stuff, but it was. <laughs> Adam and I had a whole discussion. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, he's now at Seawolf Capital. And finally, Adam Davidson, who was one of the co-founders of NPR's Planet Money and was a consultant on the movie. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk for a bit up here. I think you should wait till they say something before you apply. Uh, we're gonna talk for a bit and then we'll have time for some questions. I'm afraid we won't be able to get all the questions in, but uh, it's really encouraging to see so many people here and in the overflow room and I'm sure online as well. And I think the reason for that is, is because uh, the movie has already accomplished what Adam McKay set out to do. Adam McKay said he wanted to start a conversation about what happened in the financial crisis, what were the causes, what were the consequences, and whether we've done enough to prevent or at least reduce the odds of a repeat. And the number of people in this room and in the other room and online is evidence that they have uh, started the conversation. But I actually think the most remarkable thing is that someone could make a movie about CDS <laughs> and CB, CDO and, and uh, mortgage-backed securities and traders and uh, actually do two things of great consequence. One is to have the courage to say, we're going to step outside the movie, break the fourth wall, and I'm going to explain to you something. And, Adam Davidson and I have spent, and Greg Gipp as well, spent most of our careers trying to think of ways to explain things to people. Uh, none of us were smart enough to think about putting a beautiful woman in a bathtub <laughs> with bubble bath and champagne. So I, I give him a lot of credit, and I can only imagine what people said in Hollywood when he said, so I'm going to have this scene with Dick Thaler from the University of Chicago. But the second thing, and this is actually says something interesting about America, is uh, what Adam Davidson told us in about doing this event and he mut muttered something about Oscars. I felt like, okay, this guy has really drunk the Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> this is a movie about mortgage-backed securities, right? It has been nominated for Best Picture, Best Director. Christian Bale has been nominated for the Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Film Editing and Writing, which is just, I think, an extraordinary accomplishment. <laughs> so I'd like, I'd, like to start, I'd like to start, Adam, by asking you, so what happens? You read Michael Lewis's book, and you said, this is the humorous, funny movie I've always died of making? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. That was kind of it. It was, uh, you know, we had done a movie called The Other Guys with uh, Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell that was sort of a, a, you know, a riff on cop movies. And when we were writing the movie, we kept talking about what's the Jeopardy plot. And my co-writer, Chris Henchy, would say, like, well, maybe it's drug smugglers or... Maybe it's a, you know, a kingpin. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, this was right after the collapse. And I kept saying, we just lost $5 trillion, just disappeared. Like, it seems so quaint to do a movie with drug dealers in it. And I said, I think, I think the villain has to be like some sort of creepy, you know, hedge fund guy. No offense to hedge fund people here, but. Uh, and or creepy people. So, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to. Charming and soulful hedge fund people. Um, so I, at that point, started thinking about, could I make a laugh-out-loud comedy that was like an allegory for the collapse? And we have a crazy producer named Kevin Messick, who's an EP on this movie, who can get anyone on the phone. So 
within like two days, Paul Krugman was on the phone and I was talking to him. And I was like, I want to do a comedy allegory of the collapse. And he's like, well, let's talk about it. And we had like an hour and a half discussion and we built this whole movie that even though it was kind of laugh driven, uh, that was all about the collapse. And then in the end, I ended with these credits that talked about Ponzi schemes and the bailouts. And the movie came out and it did really well, but everyone was baffled by the part of it that was about the collapse. When they saw the credits, they were like, where did that come from? And I realized that people, you know, they were busy laughing, so they weren't really thinking about the underlying meaning. But as a result of that, I got kind of hooked on this subject. I started reading a lot. I'd had some very close family members who had lost their homes, uh, a lot of friends who had lost their jobs. We had, had to downsize our company, Funny or Die. Um, so I started realizing- The name like, of the company is Funny or Die? Uh, it is really Funny or Die, yeah. It's a website that, I don't know who knows it, who doesn't, but it's a website. <laughs> there we go. See, I'm the one who knows, not I, you. I, I, look, <laughs> I'm a budget nerd. I, I don't no, pretend no, to be no, something no, I'm no, not. Of course, of course. <laughs> of course. But, um, so I started, I just kept reading about this. And eventually when you're doing that, you come across the big short. So I picked it up one night at nine o'clock. And I remember my wife was in bed. The girls were put to bed. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna read this. And I could not put it down. And I was like, this is crazy. This is a page turner that's about this financial esoterica. And then there's these amazing characters in the middle of it. And for the first time, I feel like I sort of understand what happened with the collapse. And I was hooked at that moment. I just like, this has to be a movie. Um, and from then on, I just kept reading about it and doing it. I tend to get obsessive, so my wife will tell you. So I, from that point on, just started reading everything and watching everything. Uh, and then finally, when it came point, you know, to a point to make the movie, uh, Adam Davidson came in. And he and I would sit in my office for like six hours a day. And I would just ask him questions and we would argue. And I just kept sort of filtering what happened to like, the final goal was that I could tell my 10 year old daughter what exactly happened with the collapse. Um, for those who know Funny or Die, Pearl from The Landlord is my 10 year old daughter. <laughs> and so finally in the very end, after many discussions and arguments, I told Pearl what happened and she was like, yeah, I think I understand that. And that was it. Then I knew I was ready to do it. Pearl instead of Adam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by the way, for sure. For, for sure. sure. Yeah. So Adam, what was it like uh, being the bridge between a financial economic journalist and a bunch of Hollywood comedy writers? Yeah, it, uh, well, it was, uh, first of all, I want to say for most of that time, Pearl would walk in the room and then run out as fast as possible. That's true. Yeah, Showing her good sense. Very, yeah. yeah. Um, I, for me, when I got... My, my brother works at Paramount, and that's how the relationship started about two years ago. He said, oh, this guy Adam McKay, and I said, oh, I love his movies. He wants to do um, the, the, the Big Short. He'd love to talk to you. And you know, I probably had the same thought a lot of people would have, but when the very first time we talked, I, I realized, oh, this is just a very intelligent, curious guy who wants to understand things. I think for, for me, the transformation I, I had um, I've spent my career at NPR and the New York Times and, uh, and working hard to make this stuff intelligible, but realizing I'm reaching an audience that is already actively pursuing big public policy information. It doesn't mean they fully understand it, but they're, they, they are taking an active step. And I, I think, like many people, I had thought of popular culture, movies that play in strip mall, or not strip mall, or play wherever, <laughs> as, you know, that, that's going to be, you, you inherently have to dumb it down. And I, I think, without fully thinking about it, I thought, either you get to be someone like us, where you're a serious journalist talking to serious people about serious subjects, or you're, you're a silly clown, like Adam McKay. And, um, <laughs> and what I learned from Adam, and, and from watching him make choice after choice after choice, to keep the substance to keep um, keep the 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 real information there while also making it funny and lively and um, was that it actually is possible that that this choice I thought I had to make was a false choice and I think um, throughout I mean the experience was just as as perfect as imaginable I mean it, it was just a wonderful experience but the probably one of the great moments was we we're test screening it just at a mall in outside of Los Angeles and 
they show it just to the people who come, and then at the end of it, they do a focus group with about 20 people and ask them to explain what a CDO is. And they explain what a CDO is. And uh, these were people who didn't know what a stock or a bond really was. They couldn't tell you the difference. And, and it just, I mean, honestly, I feel like right now I'm, trying to figure out what this means for my life because I feel like... It's over, Adam. It's over, yes. <laughs> or it's just beginning. This is the peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I think what, what he accomplished was this ability to take that deep substance and engage everybody. The movie's done very well outside of, you know, coastal, highly educated cities. I do understand the Cambridge Kendall Square Theater is the single biggest dollars per <laughs> screen, but it's done very well throughout the country. So I don't think... I think everybody who's seen the movie agrees that it's engaging and clever. And we all, you know, Anthony Bourdain or Dick Thaler, those scenes are just uh, remarkable in that they actually explain something that I think uh, uh, novices, as Adam said. I think the big question is, uh, we know in our society that movies have incredible power in creating a narrative. Uh, uh, We know that... Uh, there are many uh, kids in America who all they'll ever know about Martin Luther King is Selma. And so, and we know that we went through something devastating. Uh, we went through something that most people didn't anticipate. Uh, the, the shorts in the book are, and the movie are exceptions. And we know that there, that, we, that there will be policy choices made, and sometimes policy choices are made by politicians who get their information more from movies than from Brookings uh, white papers. So we have to worry about that. So I want to talk a little bit about, is this the right narrative? What does it get right? What is it complete and what isn't complete? But I want to start with you, Danny. I mean, you kind of live this thing. So when you see the movie or read the book, does it resemble anything that was going on in real life? Uh, Certainly. I think having worked with Michael Lewis on first his article in Vanity Fair in 2009 and then what turned out to be a book. So first he thought it would just be an article. And he says, wow, I actually think I can turn this into a book. And Michael Lewis was doing what Adam was doing. Adam, Michael was doing for a book what Adam was doing for a movie. How can I tell the audience and explain this information in a way that people will understand? Michael did it. Uh, he had more pages to work with, you know, obviously, than you did, Adam. But uh, he was able to have it come across. And then it hit the public, mainstream. Um, and then in 2011, uh, Paramount came around and said, this may be picked up as a movie. Michael Lewis at that point says, it probably won't be, but just sign whatever. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so I'm all right, sign your life rights away. That's a great idea. So uh, <laughs> that happened in 2011, and the project was pretty much dead. I never kept up with it. I wasn't really paying attention to it. And then a little over a year ago, or more than that now, um, Adam's group picked it up. D.D. Gardner Brad Pitt's group picked it up, Plan B, and uh, decided to make it into a movie. So Moving, I, I thought they did an incredible job. I actually thought watching the movie, you didn't really have to know what a, a CDO was to understand the tone that was being portrayed in the movie. You probably didn't think when you watch watching the movie, I want to figure that out, I want to figure that out, because Adam was able to express, I think, the tone of what it was, what Wall Street was doing, what people were buying, that it was a bad product, that it was exploited, those type things. So in that sense, yes, the movie did a great job explaining it, but I think the way that they explained it took the pressure off of actually having to define those things in the way, whether it was fourth wall or whether it was just applying it to what was going on in the world, people losing their homes, Wall Street people not going to jail, things like that. So in that sense, it captured the element in time, I think, for what Did you really go around in Florida, knocking on doors to see if people were there? Well, we went to Florida. And Adam, am I allowed to critique the Yes, of course you are. I mean, it's a non-fiction. There was no alligator chasing us, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) There were alligators present, I'm certain of it. They were in the backyard, but we never saw any of them. But we did channel check neighborhoods in Miami, we did it in Las Vegas, we did it in California, just to see what was actually happening. Um, so it was, it was, it was interesting to, re, to relive it again, once in a book and then in a movie, is, is obviously uh, surreal. Yeah, but, I bet. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Greg, you've written about this. Uh, do you think this is the right narrative? Let's take for that everything in the movie is a pretty good representation of what happened to the shorts and everything. Is this a good way to tell people what just happened? 
hard for me to answer that because it's like asking, well, would a movie about the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand be the right way to tell the story of the First World War? I mean, that is a great big octopus of an event whose roots go back decades. And a lot, and when you have something as colossal and large and destructive as the global financial crisis, I don't think you could come up with a single story and make a movie about it that does the entire thing justice. What I love about the movie is what you said at the beginning, is that it takes part the hardest part of the story to tell, which is the the um, abstruseness of the finance and, and breaks it down into easy pieces. Even for those who cover this stuff for a living, this stuff is hard. And like everybody in my direct family, their eyes glaze over and they fall asleep or they change the subject whenever I try to talk about what I do for a living. So if uh, I can get them to see this movie, maybe they'll actually stay awake long enough for me to tell them what I did that day. Um, so I think that's a real thing. But w where I would, um, where my interpretation differs from Adams is that like he's, he has a very moralistic uh, kind of undertone to the movie, and it comes up very strongly in the coda at the end. And I think that that's kind of simplistic, because um, greed and bad incentives and criminality are evergreens. They did not suddenly erupt, and we didn't have five more of it in five times more of it in the 2000s than in other decades. The question has to be, how did those ever-present features of humanity somehow also catalyze into a crisis that's damaging? And for that, you have to turn it to the, the broader forces, which really don't get talked much about in the movie. You know, Why were interest rates so low? Why was this giant pool of money the name of this uh, fabulous um, uh, research series that Adam uh, head, headed up. Like all these financial, like we talk about all these derivatives, the people who are designing these derivatives thought they were fixing flaws in the system that made it um, uh, unsafe. And in fact, they were actually doing the opposite. A lot of the, the, the people who um, were closest to the mortgage market lost the most money. I mean, Dick Fold lost his company, you know, like Angelo Mazzillo lost his company. All the, all the heads of all those companies who were on the wrong side of the shorts lost their jobs, most of them some of them lost their companies. They were drinking the Kool-Aid. So when the question comes down to uh, was it criminality or was it stupidity, I guess, Adam, you probably are more on the criminality side and probably more on the stupidity side. But even well, We sort the, of leave yeah. it as an open question. I mean, there's a fine line between both. One of the themes of the movie is what's the difference between criminality and stupidity and pride? So, but anyway, continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, in any, um, but th the more I thought about it afterwards, the more I also began to realize that even if you're like me and you tend to think of these sort of like global forces going on, those forces actualize themselves through human beings, okay? We've just seen it in the panic in the markets for the last few weeks. Smart people like us and Olivier Blanchard are going around scratching their heads trying to figure out why the markets are panicking because the markets act through human beings with their belief systems and their incentive systems. And we need stories like The Big Short to remind us of the human beings who are actualizing these forces I'm just talking about. There are reasons that we cannot explain using economics why sometimes housing uh, bubbles inflate and deflate and don't cause a crisis, and sometimes they do. And so that's why I'm glad we have this movie. Don, does it resemble anything that you saw from the inside? Uh, yes, I certainly had some Bad flashbacks there. <laughs> Bear Stearns was going down. I think if I could expand a little bit on Greg's points, to me the Kool-Aid was partly, uh, importantly, about 20 years of prosperity with very few recessions, 25 years of prosperity, something economists call the great moderation. Business cycles hadn't been abolished, but they were much narrower. Economies recovered. They didn't happen very often. House prices always went up. So I think there was a huge amount of complacency in the system. In the, the point is raised in the movie and certainly in the book, who was on the other side of these trades? Why weren't they more careful about what they were doing? Why weren't they digging in? And I think they thought because, oh, uh, nothing bad can really happen, or if it's going to happen, it'll be kind of small, because it's last 25 years, that's all that's really happened. I think a second point to make in terms of how it got amplified and magnified is the tremendous co complexity of the interactions within the financial sector. So people often uh, contrast the dot-com bust and the housing bust. And in both cases, I think the loss of wealth wasn't that different. But one resulted in a very shallow recession and one resulted in a horrible great recession with lots of uh, huge unemployment, 10%, et cetera. And I think part of the problem was the financial institution, it wasn't just that some people made money and some people lost money, that went through the financial institutions that are at the heart of our market economy. The, the CDOs and CDSs were so opaque, no one knew where the losses were coming to rest. 
And so everyone fled. So what happened in the fall of 2008 was a huge run on banks, on money market funds, on everything. And that's what really amplified the shock coming from the housing market was the collapse of the financial system. And that's what I didn't see coming. I mean, I thought in, in the middle of 2005, the Federal Reserve, we had a briefing and it said, houses are 20% overvalued. But unfortunately, the other part of the briefing was, yeah, when they collapse, there'll be some problems and it's a bad thing. <laughs> but no one foresaw the kind of the kind of collapse of the financial system that made it so awful. Adam, let me ask, ask you a little bit about the ending. So it must be hard to figure out how to end a movie like this. Sure. And the viewer is, le is left with the impression that we didn't do anything. Uh -huh. um, and I think, I'm sure you've heard, uh, even today, given that you're in Washington, that people who actually think we did stuff, maybe not enough, uh, wonder why did you leave it that way? Did you, have you had second thoughts? Uh, no, no second thoughts. But I, I think we talked about the idea that, you know, I think at this point there's no question the banks have continued to grow. I would say they, they are still too big to fail. I would say you look at the ratings agencies, no real beyond paying some fines, nothing really happened to them. No one was put in jail except for one banker. Uh, to me, yes, Dodd-Frank had some great stuff in it, so that's fine, uh, but I, I don't think it went far enough. And I think as far as the recovery that we've had, we've seen that it's been a recovery more for the top 1%, and the 99% has had wages that are flat. Um, but just back to what these gentlemen were talking about real quickly, which I think is important, I think there's definitely some very large macro forces in play that contributed to the collapse, but I think it can't be downplayed the hunger that these banks had once they created these uh, esoteric securities that they were selling these products. Once they started making money off these MBSs, you saw banking, as far as a portion of GDP in the 70s, go from 6% to, at the peak of this bubble, 24%. So there was a massive hunger going on in banking for these mortgages to fill out these products. And I think to say that that's just a byproduct of you know, a bubble or, or certain larger macro forces isn't exactly correct. I think there was clearly a fine line between stupidity, blindness, and fraud that was in action. And everyone was getting paid at every level of this. Um, so anyway, just to answer that, yeah. Adam, Adam what did you? What did you think of the ending? Um, you know, I'd say the biggest fights we had, and that's why we're sitting on opposite ends of the table. Yeah, we can no longer be in the same room together, although we agreed through lawyers to be here together tonight. But, um, uh, you know, I think we talked a lot about, about the ending. And um, can I say one thing? Davidson gave me the ending of the bespoke tranche opportunities, which yeah. is the very ending of the movie. Yeah. And it gave me right in the edit room, and I was like, that is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You may have dropped your mic. Oh. Um, so, so I, I mean, look, I, I think um, I'm fully with Greg that there was, and, you know, much, much, much of my work during the crisis was about, there was global macroeconomic trends. There was a, a you know, I, I basically buy the global savings glut story that Brookings uh, Ben Bernanke tells. I, 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 you know, I think uh, China, China's currency rate regime, and you know, tepid growth in Japan and Europe contributed to global capital market imbalances that created the conditions for some kind of bubble somewhere. This desperate search for yield, um, and. I did pitch to McKay that there'd be like 45 minutes in the middle where I explain all of this, but <laughs> you couldn't even shoot it to humor me. No. And, um, and showing his good sense yeah, once again. You're right. But I think that. He's been in a bubble bath. Yeah. <laughs> but I think. Um, I think that for, particularly for an American audience, but I think for a global audience, that the, one of the major lessons I learned in this crisis, and it really happened when I truly learned what a CDO is and understood this product and learned that this product cannot, and, and I, I don't want to go into too much of it, but a so CDO I, is, there's basically a sub, there's a mortgage. And, they just saw the movie. They don't yeah, need they the saw the movie. Okay, good. And they did it better than yeah. you were going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I helped write that. But um, so the, 
This CDO cannot exist in an environment where there is aggressive regulation. It can't exist when there's what I, before the crisis, believed in, a, you know, a truly self-correcting market. And the, the CDO, to me, learning what the CDO is and learning that this thing passed through all the checks that I truly believed in, that I, you know, that, that I believed in, proved to me that the grown-ups weren't as all-knowing, weren't as, um, as, as solid as I expected. All right, but, uh, Danny, do you think that everything is the same as it was five years ago, or have we made some improvements? Oh, it's very different. Uh, pendulum has swung from one side to the other, and I think we'll find a nice medium, but I think all the things that have happened from a regulatory perspective are positive to make a sound system, and the Dodd-Frank and Volcker rules are, are very good. The, the TARP and the TALF programs ended up working very well. Um, and now we're going to see the other side of the equation, careful what you wish for. It's actually the right move, but the lack of liquidity now that the Wall Street firms have, which makes them not too big to fail, which is kind of where we want to get to, is creating, I believe, and will create over the next years to come, a lot of volatility. Um, and we've seen some of that recently. And it's not so much about the Fed raising rates as it is that they don't have your back anymore from a quantitative easing perspective, which is great also. The Fed should be doing what they're doing. But I think we have to adjust to the new normal. And as Adam's alluding to and, and, and Greg mentioned, I do think that Wall Street's incentives, um, if, if they find a product they love, whether it's, you know, whether it's tulips back in the 1800s, whether it's internet stocks, wh whatever it is, when they see it making money, they'll, they'll make as much money as they can for a period of time. And to Adam's point, the system's now changed where that's not possible, but the lack of liquidity, again, which is a good thing, is going to be posing, is going right, to bring a lot of... But the most poignant, for me, the most poignant scene in the movie is when you, I don't know if this actually happened, knock on the door of a guy who is renting a house, paying his mortgage, paying his rent, landlord isn't paying the thing, and then you see him living in the car. I mean, that... Uh, like, I don't really care that somebody at lost money and, and because they were in the Bear Stearns hedge fund, but I care about that guy. And, and there are things we have done, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau most notably, to make that less likely to happen. And you wouldn't know that at the end of the movie. I don't, I'm not can saying I, that you can put everything in a movie, but you leave the tone that nothing has actually been done. Well, I would say the big elephant in the room is that our government is still completely captured by the banks. And I think, let's not pretend. I mean, what's happened with finance, you know, campaign finance reform is ridiculous. Uh, I in no way trust our government with the amount of money the banks are funneling into our Congress to, to buy, to overturn, to water down. Uh, you need a strong regulatory arm to balance out a market. I mean, people forget the free hand of the market quote is preceded by a chapter on mercantilism and the rules that create a free market. We don't have that right now. Our government cannot be trusted to make those changes happen, to, to be a sounding board. And yes, Dodd-Frank was great, but let's not forget right now, every one of those provisions is being fought actively. There's a, a large number of people that want to repeal it completely. So I just don't have that faith in the end, and I think our ending was pitch perfect. I think people right. need to know there's a serious problem still going on. Yeah. Frank, did you want to weigh in? Well, the, the bankers certainly don't feel they got off that easy. They've been fighting tooth and nail all these rules that have come out from the higher capital requirement well, to the existence of the their Profitability CFD. is the reason to fight it. They might as well fight it. And they're, no lot, they're a lot less profitable it. now if you actually look at their return on equity and so on. But if we were making a movie about the collapse of the NASDAQ bubble, we'd be all the regulatory, we, the discussion we'd be having would, well, was Sarbanes-Oxley good enough? Now, almost nobody remembers Sarbanes-Oxley. But actually, in the mid-2000s, when our regulators should have been looking at abuses in the mortgage market, they were obsessed with corporate governance fraud because that was what the last cycle was about. And so when I think about the present, I'm not really worried about CDOs any longer. They all blew up. They're gone. You know, there are no I'm not either, by the way. Mortgages I, being I'm written any either. longer. You know, after yeah. the 87 stock market crash, portfolio insurance disappeared. But those same incentives of, of greed, of, of what you were saying, that when Wall Street sees something, they kill it with too much capital, is going on. We were talking about this last night, Danny. Like, if you look at the price of oil for, like, four years was rock solid at around 100 bucks, and everybody said Saudi Arabia will never, ever let the price go below $90. And so all the banks who could no longer make money in, uh, uh, in real estate, they poured money into energy. 
And Danny, I know, yeah. sees some opportunities <laughs> to profit. We're not from an that energy fund, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Now, I believe, and that bubble is now actually in the process of deflating. Now, I believe that that actual deflation of that bubble is causing a lot of pain right now in places like North Dakota and Houston. But I also believe it will be far less uh, traumatic than the collapse of the housing bubble was because you don't have the same confluence of so many things. And because some of the regulations and the natural pullback from risk that occurs after an event like that has prevented the same buildup of risk that made... So, Don, let me get to Don. So, Don, what do you think, where have we done some good stuff and where do you think are the biggest gaps? So, I think we've done a lot of good stuff in the banking system. I agree with Adam that pulling back from it would be a problem, a mistake, and I worry about the people who say they want to repeal Dodd-Frank. I think it's kind of ambiguous. You have the far left and the far right who both hate the big banks. So how, the, how all that's going to work out, I don't know. But I think we've gotten to a much better, safer place. I agree with Danny's uh, comments on this. But I also think it's important from a regulatory perspective to recognize that the incentives are there to go overboard and you need the regulations and the, ca- the regulations in place to prevent abuses and the capital in place to absorb the losses in the financial system if bad things happen. The fact that the regulators in the US and UK and elsewhere have gone to stress tests on the banks are, is very helpful. So they, they stress against this kind of thing. I think where we're less complete is outside the banking system. So as the banks get more regulated, finance migrates to other places. The regulators are perfectly aware of this and they're looking at it but the laws make it much harder to regulate once you get outside these heavily regulated industries like banking and broker-dealers. So I think we need to be really careful that regulating the core doesn't create problems outside. And what about the rating agencies? Adam made the point that they somehow seem to have (laughs) gotten off scot-free. They're doing really, really well. That's a disappointment to me also. So I think there have been a lot of changes made, but I wonder if there's enough. The basic model is a very difficult model. It's a model where the issuer pays. And so the incentives are to make the issuer happy. The other side of this is you don't want to get a bad reputation that you're not doing good good work. Um, But the incentives to make the issuer happy, as we saw in the movie, are very, very powerful. That was a pretty subtle thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to change that model. It used to be that the purchasers paid. Investors. Investors paid. And then the Xerox machine was invented. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And then so one investor paid and then distributed it all. So uh, they had to go to the issuer pays. Uh, it'd be great to come up with a different model where the incentives were lined up better with the public interest. Adam? So, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I wanted, I, one of the things that, that I got from working with McKay is a sense of moral outrage that I think we wanted people to leave the theater with. And that was did not come easy to me. I feel like the, I come from the world of sort of calm Brookings Institution panels where <laughs> you, you, you say things that are very calm and reasonable, like I believe that rent-seeking regulatory capture is a deep issue in America. I think, is there any... You must, be, you must be at some earlier iteration of... Oh, okay, yeah. You're this dating before, yourself. This is that before was you became, the before you came, yeah. But let me ask, are there any PhD economists in the room who don't think that regulatory capture and rent-seeking are really serious issues among the financial services? I think, I yeah, see but, some PhD economists. I think we all know that's a deep, deep issue in our country, that something has changed somehow, we can discuss how, in the last 40 years or so, where finance has shifted. And this is not a fringe lefty view. This is a mainstream core view held, I think, it is the consensus view of economists that um, the way, a major way the financial services industry makes money is through rent seeking and regulatory capture. Those are fancy words for the way I think about it is you can make money by creating new products and services that benefit people, or you can make money by transferring wealth from those who do create good new productivity, enhancing products and services to yourself. And we see that very clearly in 
you know, farm subsidies where, you know, soybean farmers or something get money that we probably all agree they shouldn't get, but they do because they have three congressmen. The, the banks really do have all the congressmen because every congressman has the biggest bank, the biggest. That. They that's have a lot fair, of them. That's not fair. And, uh, you well, know, on behalf of, of Bernie them. Sanders There's and Sherrod Brown. There's a few. I, I, There's a few. I take okay. exception right. to you. Okay. Right. There's okay. seven. So, okay. yeah, only 532 of Danny, the, you're, yeah. You're, but you're, what, you're, yeah. Just if I can just say, so I think the, the outrage... The, the, the outrage that, I, that viewers leave, I, I, I don't, the two minutes at the end of the film that I would have written are different maybe from what Adam would have written, although maybe not all that different, but the outrage that we saw people leave, I think is the right outrage. That's the okay. right register to engage our economy, and I wish more people. Danny, did you yeah. want to? End? No, I was gonna say, I, I wanna go back to. Oh yeah, go ahead. Let's go back to yeah. Don's comments, because um, I think it's really important to understand that it's a secular shift right now on Wall Street. It's not cyclical. What I mean is that the jobs that are being lost right now in the fixed income businesses, what we call fixed businesses, are permanent. Um, they're adhering to, they're, they're doing the work that Dodd-Frank, Volcker Rule are supposed to be doing. Um, they're already doing it. So the behavior has changed. So what it does is it, it creates, which is what we want, a not too big to fail environment where wholesale funded businesses are being created. If you have a product that survives, that's wholesale funded and does well, you're gonna get rewarded for it. If it doesn't, it goes out of business and it won't affect anyone in this room except the people that had money invested in the firm. And that's kind of where we wanna to get to. And the second comment I just wanted to make on rating agencies, and Adam does a great job in the film, and I think it's really important to understand this, is that the first meeting we ever had, it was Vinny and I in early 2006 with the rating agencies at a conference in Florida. And Vinny has, Vinny was, he was great in the movie, he was portrayed great, but there was a, there was a moment where the Moody's representative, it was Moody's, not S&P, the first meeting, said to us, we said, well, show us your models, how do you look at, how do you look at subprime bonds? How do, and so they showed us what bonds look like when the market's up 5% housing, when it's up 10, when it's up 15, and at that point, it'd be going up every year. We're like, well, where's your um, flat uh, model for flat home prices. Well, we don't have that. <laughs> home price. wow. And where's your down model? Well, that doesn't exist. And, and it was at that moment that we said to ourselves, okay, and Vinny had a tell. Vinny had a great tell. I didn't come out of the movie, but <laughs> Vinny would say, Vinny would do the, the, the fist to the cheek, and then I look, I knew we had something. You know, <laughs> so uh, there's, there, those were the kind of things that were going on behind the scenes that, not behind, that actually were happening. And this was a conference where it was all fixed income investors. And so um, anyway, so I want to just comment on those. Yeah, on those Adam, you want? Well, I was just curious, Danny, because you're obviously still active and working. Like, what do you think of the SEC? Like, is that something that scares you? Is that something you're aware of? I can't comment on the other. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're aware. Thank you, everyone. No, sorry, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for coming. Enjoy the meal. Yeah. No, uh, hey, can I make no. a point here, though? Because I mean, we heard uh, this shit. over and over again. By the way, when we would talk to people working in the industry, they would literally laugh about the SEC. And they weren't sophisticated. You know, I don't think. I just want to say, I, and I'll. I'm not going to go after the SEC. I'll actually no, no, you, you did not. You no, no, but I that. said there's only so much that I don't think. I actually believe that at the end of the day, Greggles. I don't think the banks realized what they had created, what had happened. I'm not giving them a free pass. I'm just saying it got so big so quickly, and it was in so many different places that I don't think there was a way to actually sum up how much synthetic gambling was going on in the markets. Because if you create a sell, you create a buy. You did it in the blackjack table, obviously, on the, in, the, in the movie. But that's really, you, you don't know how many people are lined up behind the blackjack table. And I really don't think they had a grip. And I think when the government went to kind of look to rescue or the first iteration of providing some type of aid to these banks, I really, and Don was probably involved in those discussions, I don't think anyone really realized how, how big the problem was. And I think it kept evolving and evolving. To think that all of a sudden Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are at risk because there could be a run on the bank. So... I'm not defending that situation at all. I'm just saying I, th I think it was it got so big that it was uncharted territory for everybody. Greg, so. you want well, I was going to also add. Uh, well, first of all, I, one of the most interesting characters in The Big Short, he's he's touched on in the movie, but he's written about more in the book, is Howie Hubler, who's a uh, bond trader for sure. Morgan Stanley, and he actually, like um, uh, um, Greg Lipman, realizes that there's a big uh, short to be had here, and he starts shorting the lower-rated tranches of the mortgage-backed securities. But it's very expensive to do that because it's basically buying an insurance premium, and every month you're paying out this great big premium. So he needs to find a way to like defray the cost. So he sells some insurance on the AAA rated portions because even though he correctly uh, ascertains that this lower rated stuff is going to go to heck, 
he incorrectly believes by Zakule that the AAA stuff will not. So this kind of um, reconciles why some people could correctly guess that things have gotten out of hand and yet still drive their company into the ground because they had outsourced the due diligence to the rating agencies who had built their assumptions on models built on periods of time that had never seen a home price decline because never, one never had happened in their uh, you know, uh, working yeah. knowledge. So as I'm often stunned when I uh, work in this business how the people I meet, I presume a lot of like, uh, knowledge and due diligence on their part, and sometimes it's not there. It's a funny thing that Goldman Sachs gets a lot of like, bad rap, but they were on the short side through all this thing. And if you take a look in 2008, there's a list that Bloomberg did of how much money all these guys had lost. UBS, uh, AIG, uh, Morgan Stanley, it's billions and billions and billions. You go through the entire top 20, Goldman Sachs isn't there. And it's not because Goldman Sachs is altruistic and honest and they're good guys and so on. No, it's because they did their own due diligence and they didn't drink the Kool-Aid, right? So well, many other people were drinking. They, did a little, they played a little bit both sides, yeah. you know, abacus. But I want to get to the I want to get to Adam's moral outrage point because I don't actually agree, Adam. That I mean, I think that newspapers like moral outrage. I mean, I remember, I'm so old. I was covering the Treasury when there was the Solomon Brothers scandal on the on the uh, Treasury thing, and I remember Al Hunt. I was trying to explain it to Al Hunt. I didn't have the advantage uh, that Adam had. And, and Al Hunt said, who's the bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal, says, I don't really want to understand it. I just want to know who I should be pissed at, <laughs> right? And we did a piece about how the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee uh, met and all that stuff. And so he was happy, and I kept my job. But my question about moral outrage is, <clears throat> if I watch the movie, I think the people who are long the housing market are evil, and the people who are short the housing market are somehow morally superior. Is that what you, is that what you think? Well, it's or is that a dramatic device? It's a very tricky story because it is real life. So what I loved about it was there were no clear white hats or black hats. Uh, I think guys like Danny in the beginning were doing their job. I think they believed that the market, when there's a bad investment, you should find the counter investment. And that's how the market corrects. And when I've talked to all these real people, I get this sense that they believed in the market. And then there's a moment where they realize the market has been corrupted on numerous levels. And I sense this deflation, especially from Jamie and Charlie. They almost, to this day, are so angry. And it was like they were told there was no Santa Claus when they were six. And they're so hurt by it. Uh, but if you look at what Danny did with Front Point and what they targeted with Steve Eisman, it was always corrupt companies. It was always companies that were, you know, way over their skis or full of pride. Um, so I, I don't think the morality of the movie really falls in the longs and shorts or the investment. I think one of the, the moments of the movie I'm most proud of is in the end when Mark Baum, a.k.a. Steve Eisman, makes $200 million on that rooftop, and everyone feels crappy about it, including the main character. And we were just saying, like, when, when in an American movie does that ever happen? Like, normally it would be you'd play I Feel Good by James Brown, and he would dance off. And I think that's really kind of what the movie's about, which is profit at what cost, you know, wealth at what cost, and what is, you know, for the character of Mark Baum in our movie, uh, at that moment, he feels like he's become one of the rest of them, and it, it destroys him. Um, so the morality is very ambiguous because it's a system that's like a wood chipper. It just chewed everyone up. I mean, there's, I, I can't think of any like real clear heroes that came out of it. Uh, and that was important to us in telling the story. That's kind of the way we were looking at it. Hmm, interesting. Uh, before we turn to questions, anybody want to throw anything else on the table? I'd like to pick up a point Adam made, which was uh, taking the other side of these trades. I remember when I read the book first, and it came back in the movie, these guys had a lot of trouble figuring out how to take the other side of the trade, how to short this market, what was inside the bonds. We would have been better off if more people could see inside those bonds, make that short trade, in 2004 and 2005, we might not have had the uh, bubble that we had, or at least not as high as we had. So I think um, I th the market doesn't really know about morality, but it would be great to have 
a market where it'd be easy, just as easy to take both sides of the market. But Don, Don, you realize you just made an argument in favor of more financial innovation and derivatives. <laughs> as well, long I, as it's wisely handled <laughs> and there's enough capital. Oh, what could go wrong? <laughs> it seems like morality in the market is transparency. I think yeah. that's what I would say. I, yeah. 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 And, uh, I completely it's also agree. amazing with Danny and his company. They weren't, you guys weren't into bonds, right? I mean, they, they were equities were, guys. He told me he had to buy whole new computers. Yeah. He had to subscribe yeah. to the, I, like, I, I, Two more screens to my Bloomberg to watch fixed income <laughs> prices. But we were, I would just add to that, um, we traded equities and we were trading the underlying equities because we focused on financial services of the subprime mortgage companies that were public. And they were going down so quickly that we couldn't short more. There was no borrow availability. When you short something, you need to borrow the stock to do it. They were paying these massive dividends, whether how long they were going to do that or not. So the cost to short the underlying equity of these companies was bad. So we asked the next question, where are the bonds that are on their balance sheet? Where else can we get access to those? And it was that simple. And, and what was weird is that the equities were dropping. If you remember, there was a long period of time, and Adam gets that across in the movie, where the equities of these companies were getting hit, but the bonds, not the, not the corporate bonds of the company, but the bonds that they actually created were holding up. And so for us, it was an opportunity cost. It was, we can pay 2 to 3% and short these bonds at par, and our risk is literally 2 to 3%, unless you think the bonds are going to go much higher than par, or short a stock that you're paying basically 30 to 40% per year to keep it short on. So ours happened to be an economic decision. And then we, we kind of got a little bit more confidence, a little bit more confidence that went on. And Adam kind of realized in that you could not have portrayed the Steve Eisman, Wing Chow dinner any better than you did. It's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, and watching Steve's face. Also a great scene. A great scene. Great. There was so much accuracy. I will say the movie was very accurate. It's the Nobu thing. I, the, the, <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but um, it was very accurate. And this is how it just kept evolving. And every time we'd have a meeting with somebody, we'd be like, is this happening? Is this really? And so you got that across, I thought, in a great way. And you did a great so, job on Adam, it. So. Adam, if you were going to make another movie about this realm, would, where, where would you look? God, that's an interesting... I, I don't know. Uh, let me think. Uh, well, you know, I would look back to Michael Lewis's books, but that's a cheat. I yeah. won't do that to you. Let me think of my own idea. <laughs> Twelve angry FOMC members. <laughs> you know what? I would probably do a movie hey, about. I would Ben's probably book. do a movie about loan sharks. Is really what I would do. I would. You know what I would do? I would do payday, payday lenders. Lending. That's payday what lending. I would do. I think that's an amazing story, and uh, that is a world that obviously is being challenged by Dodd Frank, which was great, but it's still out there and it eviscerates people. That would be a very cool world. Okay. Yeah. You heard it here first. All right. We're going to have a lot of questions, and we're not going to get them all. So I'm going to take like three or four questions. We'll let people respond, and then we'll take a few more. Uh, there's a guy on the aisle there. Uh, yep. Yeah. The mic's coming to you. So tell us who you are and make it short. Uh -huh. My question is very quick. I, I want to know whether or not... Oh, my name is Mike Golash, Amalgamated Transit Union. I want to know if the question is whether or not the problems you saw that arise as a result of the financial crisis were more deeply rooted in the whole system of capitalism, where accumulation of wealth constantly requires more and more investment. But on the other hand, people don't have enough money to buy the stuff. So you need financial, you know, instruments credit, et cetera, et cetera, and that leads to constant bubbles, whether it's housing, cars, schools, whatever it is, and there's sort of that inherent contradiction, which okay. Europe didn't really address in your movie. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, I'm going to get a couple before we Oh, go. yeah, sure. Uh, sure. There's a woman here. Can you bring the mic? Who's there? In the black, can you stand up? And then pass the mic behind you. My name is Eliana Sacker. I wonder why the media that covers the finances doesn't disclose didn't disclose the financial shenanigans at the time. Didn't see the oil going down from 100 to 27. And doesn't report it to the public. Thank you. OK, and why don't you pass the mic behind you there to the gentleman in the, with the blue scarf. The image of the uh, banker used to be uh, this uh, patriarchal, uh, trusted figure like uh, Walter Cronkite with a beard. but. Now it seems that it's more like uh, Gordon Gecko and, and Wall Street, and I wonder how healthy that is to uh, to have the kind of Ivan Besky face on capitalism between skepticism and trust. On the other hand, where do you? Okay, why don't we take one more? Uh, there's a gentleman on the aisle there, Mike. 
Alejandro Becerra, uh, thank you so much for making the film. I love the way you ended. Um, you said that immigrants and poor people would be blamed. They continue to be so, uh -huh. except that now that we know that these loans were made to everybody who, who could chew gum and could be lured into these loans. Uh, and in fact, immigrants were, uh, were targeted for good and bad reasons. The good reasons is that they, pr they were often good credit risk. They had good credit records, uh, even though they, were, they had thin files. And in fact, immigrants have fared better than native-born Americans in keeping their homes. Well, Could thanks. you say something right. about that? Thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Greg, do you want to defend the media, or do you want me to defend the media? Or? Uh, look, or a lot make of, excuses. The, the, a lot of uh, my colleagues uh, at the Journal, um, then and now, and another organization, spent a lot of time writing about the things before the crisis and after the crisis that we thought could lead to a crisis. There was no mystery about the fact that housing was a bubble. Uh, we're acting very bubbly, that there's a lot of shoddy underwriting uh, going on. We wrote a lot of stories about that. I'd, a colleague of, mine, colleague of mine, Greg Zuckerman, in the December of 2005, wrote about John Paulson shorting Mortgage-backed securities. Um, I wrote a number of stories about how a housing bubble could collapse and, and have another things. I never understood the esoterica, which is a centerpiece of your movie. And I think this is another reason why I appreciate the movie, which is that I think that at a certain level, I was, if not in, I was, it's not so much that I was intimidated, it was that I was um, exhausted. I mean, is that you get this jargon thrown at you all the time, and these people sound like they know what you're talking about, and there's nobody who's not captured by the system who can tell you exactly how it works, because everybody who understands how it works has drunk the Kool-Aid and is part of the system. Um, the, uh, so, I, I don't know, Adam, if you want to speak to this as well, though. It's just... And the other thing is that there's so many things coming at you all the time. I, I remember I wrote, uh, I spent all the time uh, at the height of the bubble writing a big feature article about how the leveraged buyout boom was going to bring us all down, which is a famous comment by Chuck Prince, you got to keep dancing. As long as music explains, you got to keep dancing. He was talking about leveraged buyouts. And I was wrong. LBOs didn't cause the crisis. Right. So I would say that um, the press failed um, because if we had done a better job, we would have, people would have heard the Paul Revere cry. Some of us tried, a lot of us fell short, and none of us had offices at the Wall Street Journal like the ones that are in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just make one comment on uh, that? Yeah. That I just and, want to make one comment that in the book, um, we turned off uh, CNBC. If anyone read the book, I realized we, we turned it off because it was too much. And, and I'm sure Greg and David both wrote pieces, and there were, there were workers, that, people that worked with them that also wrote pieces. It's easy to say that now, but from a behavioral finance perspective, no one wanted to hear that the housing market was going to crash. You're going to go to a party and, and talk about that? You'll be drinking alone in a corner. So I think it's easy to look back now and say, oh, that, that you know, but you were a man on an island or, or you were a person on an island if you were making that call. And so it wasn't, so I just wanted to add that, that it's easy I, to look back. Just one thing, and once, ago, I, once again, I think it kind of points to the theme I keep hitting, which is you know, our press now tends to be owned by about five different companies. And I think we've lost to some degree that independent press, which I do think has an influence on the way these newspapers, these networks, where they look. Uh, it's just narrowed the focus quite a bit. I don't think it's healthy for journalism. Uh, that's not entirely true, of course. There's the internet. There are a lot of independent sources out there that are doing great work. But I think overall, that corporate ownership and that very narrow sort of field of view has hurt the ability of uh, our press to do its job, which gets back to our government being owned by these institutions. Don, I think the, the questioner uh, uh, about the, the role of the banker in, in the US. So I don't think it's quite right that the banker was always seen as uh, admirable patri patriarch. Uh, J.P. Morgan and his ilk were uh, the great malefactors of wealth, got plenty of grief. But we have gone to a stage where um, working on Wall Street, unless you're Danny Moses and a friend of ours, it seemed like something <laughs> wrong with you. That have, do you think we've gone too far in demonizing finance as part of the uh, uh, trying to bring it under control? I think it, things got way out of balance. And all the brightest graduates from the best schools were going into finance because it was seen as an instant wealth generator or nearly instant. You had to work very hard, but you made a lot of money. There's a big payoff for it. That pendulum had to swing back to, for the health of the society. And I think it swung back. And I don't, I don't actually 
sense that bankers are more demonized than they deserve to be demonized. Uh, there are good ones and there are bad ones. There are ones that serve their community well and there are ones that don't. I think, as, again, as a regulator, it's our job to put in place the capital regulations to constrain the behavior of the ones that aren't doing a good right. job. A little more contrition would have gone a long way, I think. Right. Now, let's take a few more. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm going to do this side. There's a gentleman there, and then there's a woman uh, with a scarf. Mike's coming. Tell us who you are and make it short. Uh, Neil Rowland, MLX News, and David, great panel. Next time, invite Brad Pitt, please. We did invite Brad Pitt, <laughs> and Adam Davidson said the reason to invite Brad Pitt was because Brad Pitt knew a surprising amount about the financial system. Does. And I told Adam, the contingent here who wanted Brad Pitt was not interested in his financial activity. <laughs> Donald Cohen, you advised uh, Fed Chairman Greenspan and Bernanke. The unbundling of, these, uh, of the MBSs that was done admirably by the shorts, should any regulators have been doing that, or was it correct to cede it to the credit rating agencies that failed to do so? Okay, thank you. Let well, uh, me get a couple. A woman here, and then there's a gentleman sitting next to you, and then the woman behind. Hello. My name is Natalia. I think we all agree that this film has done a great job explaining a complicated problem in a way that was very accessible to the public. And so my challenge is, how do we now explain nuanced solutions to the public in an equal way so that it doesn't just become, well, we should put all everybody in jail and never have any more bailouts? Thank you. Why don't you give them to the mic to the gentleman next to you, and then there's a woman behind you. Yeah, stand up so they can see you. Name's Michael. Um, I had the, um, the pleasure of being on the other side of the desk with you folks. I spent... 15 years on Wall Street, I left in disgust. It, it didn't sit with me very well in 09, but I was uh, um, on a structured derivative desk. We were creating bespoke synthetic CDS. We did that. Um, and I think I, when I read the book, it was fascinating because it validated what I had thought had gone on. The movie as well, but I'm still digesting it. I just saw it. Um, but some of the things that this, the things that I, so the question going forward is what do we do now, right, in my opinion? Mm -hmm. And some of the things that I think are really important were missed. Um, and those require us to look back at ourselves as a culture, which isn't, doesn't make for a good movie. Um, and two quick things, you hit on it, um, and then you hit on it as well from the Wall Street Journal. One of them is, our, is our, our desire to buy cheap goods from China. And sitting on the desk, creating those bespoke ABS, CDX, we were selling those to Chinese companies so they could, or, or, or their foreign central reserves, so they, could, so they could prop up or prop down their dollar. They can manage that to, to give us cheap goods. That was our fault. We did that. We bought those cheap goods. Um, and the other thing was um, um, home ownership. Like, we had this dream that home ownership is some right or privilege. And th the folks on Wall Street, we didn't sell anything that people weren't willing to buy. You know, they didn't create this wealth and put it in their pocket. Like someone had mentioned, there was always someone on the other side of the trade, you know. Um, so... I don't. I left Wall Street because I didn't like it. Right? It doesn't fit for me. But I think it's wrong to paint the broad brush that they're all evil people. They're not. They're worse than bad actors. Thank you. There's a woman. Uh, pass it back. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Rice with the National Fair Housing Alliance. And my question is for you. Um, for me. No, Mr. McKay. Oh, phew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next question for you. Um, but one of the themes in your movie is, you know, this sort of concept that it was these few people. Um, who were insiders on Wall Street, um, who saw the, the crisis coming. And obviously, there were many, many more people who saw the crisis coming, lots of civil rights organizations, lots of consumer protection agencies who had been working years before the crisis to stop a lot of the, the practices that were contributing to the bubble and um, ultimately caused the foreclosure crisis. And I'm just wondering, A, if you were aware of those organizations and of those efforts, and B, if you were aware, why you didn't include you know, that element in the, the movie and what your thoughts were there. You want to take that one first? Well, it's it's uh, really simple. Yes, I was aware of those efforts, but it's, it's just really we have two hours. So it was, it, we really focused on these individuals and what I like. <laughs> uh, uh, and what I loved about people like Danny and these characters was that, you know, they were people involved in Wall Street, but their sort of outsider nature, the idea of Dr. Burry being a guy who didn't watch any TV, 
who didn't participate in our 24-hour sort of culture of America just listened to like Sepultura and Speed Metal and read numbers? Why was he able to see it when we weren't? So I, I like that question at the center of it, but you're absolutely right. There were other people that saw you, it and worked hard to try and prevent it. And it was a, it's a tough question about, is there a way to dramatize nuanced solutions to go with your yeah. nuance? Diagnosis. I, you know, we, we really wanted to take the audience to the point of waking up about this, being familiar with it. One of the big points of the movie was that you shouldn't be intimidated by this strange jargon. You should be able to talk about this. Don't let anyone tell you you're not an expert. Here's what happened. You should be outraged. And then the next step comes after that. We didn't go as far as solutions. But don't mistake the film. Banking is essential and necessary. It's a major part of modern civilization. We don't hate banking. We just hate banking when it gets too good at, you know, setting its own rules and then it runs amok. That's what we're against. So, um, you know, a lot of what we talked about with people is like, what, what can we do? We can vote. We can speak out. We should know that our representatives, how much money they're taking from banks. And we're trying to be proactive in that sense. And we're talking about ideas like capital requirements, We've already have some ideas about how to get these ideas across to more mainstream audiences. Uh, so the next part is the solution. We just felt like the story had kind of gone dormant, and the idea of this movie was to wake it up. Don, uh, did the why didn't the authorities see what the shorts saw? Well, I think we did. As I said, I think we did see that there was a bubble. What we didn't see was the weaknesses in the financial system. And in particular, it's partly an answer to the CDO, CDS thing. So maybe we didn't understand those as well as we should have. But I think one of the things we did, did not understand was we thought the risk was dispersed through the financial system. And that, yes, pri the house prices could fall and people would lose money and that was too bad. But that ended up being very concentrated in a few institutions. And this question that constantly is raised in the movie and in the book, who was on the other side? A lot of it was AIG, who had to come in for a bailout, uh, several monoline insurance companies, and several large institutions. And I think we thought that things were better spread around. And, the, and we didn't understand these, these very opaque instruments and their opaque interconnections and how everything came back to rest. There was a small nuance that happened in the early 90s. There was a GSE bill that was passed in 1992, I believe. Government-sponsored enterprises. Correct, Fannie sorry, Fannie and Freddie. And it was about housing affordability and people should own homes. And it was a very pro-housing bill, which is great, except to your mortgage-backed security question, it changed, this is a little technical, but it changed the risk weighting of mortgage-backed securities on banks' balance sheets. And so what I'm Conformed saying is- to Basel, right? Well, no, the Basel This is pre-Basel. This is pre-Basel. Pre so this yeah. is 1992. So you could have mortgages on your balance sheet and you would not be required to keep as much capital against those mortgages as you would prior to that bill. So, so that, I think, helped not contribute to the crisis that would have happened, but the measuring the risk at the banks in those levels became a little bit different. It became a little bit harder at that point. Um, and then I just, you know, as banks were, were in 2006 and 2007, given their quarterly earnings and their level three assets, level one, level two, level three, which is somewhat subjective, they had hedges on that they thought were hedges against these level three. So is what the FDIC would look at or the OCC would look at, they say, okay, well, we take, you know, take their word for it. It looks okay. It looks like it's balanced. And it wasn't stress tested, I guess, at the time enough. So I would just explain that one question you asked before. I think it was a- Right. I think that, I think that another way of saying what you said is that there were people, as the questioner said, who saw consumers being ripped off. Uh, they didn't get a very friendly airing from Alan Greenspan's Federal Reserve, but Ned Gramlich, who was a governor of the Federal Reserve, was concerned about this, not because he thought it was going to bring down the entire financial system, but they saw that there were some consumers who were not being protected. I think the surprise was at what, what Danny suggested, that, it was so, that, that there was such a house of cards built on this assumption that housing prices would fall that, that would cause the worst recession in most of our lifetimes. The financial crisis that Ben Bernanke describes is worse than the Great Depression itself. That really was an extraordinary failure of imagination that we did.
Can I quickly touch on the question that she had about like how do we explain the solutions that are sometimes nuanced? I don't think the regulations we describe are actually that complicated. The reason that they're controversial is because there are genuine disagreements on whether they actually on net actually do any good. And I'll just bring up a couple of examples. Um, uh, one thing almost everybody agrees, I certainly agree, is we should have more capital. You know, banks are less likely to fail with more capital. Um, well, one of the Unintended consequences of that is the FDIC now requires new banks to have a lot more capital than they used to. As a consequence, we have had no new banks except one created in the last five years. So one reason our too big to fail problem is getting worse is because no new banks are being created. This is a form of regulatory capture. Big banks love the fact that it's very difficult to start a new <coughs> bank now. Now, you've talked about how big a problem it is in the bond markets now. The lack of liquidity is terrible. The re one of the important reasons is because Dodd-Frank and the, and the Basel rule said, hey, we learned that we need to have banks hold more capital for their bond trading books. We are basically, the taxpayers subsidizing your hedge fund's ability to access liquidity at these banks. That has to stop. That's why you can't get the liquidity you used to. So you, you're obviously on the cost side of the cost benefit test, of making banks hold more capital. So if breaking up the big banks sounds like an easy solution, Try and figure out why the, Demo the Democratic Party is tearing itself apart over this same question because there are strong arguments on both sides. And can I just mention that one bank, I happen to be friends with the guy who started it, he's an Amish bishop and it's a bank that serves the Amish community in Burdenhead, Pennsylvania. I just want to mention that. So, <laughs> so I think that I, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it here because uh, Adam and Adam have another engagement. Uh, I want to end where I began, that there is no question that Adam McKay has started a conversation. I mean, it's 7.40 on an eight. And I, I personally don't want Adam McKay and Hollywood to come up with nuanced solutions. <laughs> but I think that it's really important that without a, a, a conversation and without dramatizing people getting hurt and bad guys and good guys, we'll never get to the point of having nuanced solutions. So thank you all for coming, and thank you to all of you for the day.